Shalom, brothers and sisters. So, let's talk red heifers again. And I encourage you, go on my channel, go search through the videos. I did a video specifically just on the red heifers last year sometime already. It is there with a lot more detail. Go watch it. And then I update on the red heifer regularly. Because it is important. Even though some great big leaders in the Christian community have a tendency to knock down anything we get excited about and say don't run after people that talk about this and fanaticists and you know people that are trying to just get views no this is end time stuff it is happening it's all part of the process and we should be excited about these things so pray for them if they want to knock it down the whole time but let's look at it because it gets knocked the whole time as of march the 17th 2023 they were two years old which means March the 17th this year, they'll be three years old. So for those saying they have to be three years old. But we'll get into that in more detail. What do five red heifers have to do with the October 7 massacre? I've covered this as well. At the 100-day mark of the war, Abu Obeida, the military spokesperson for Hamas, gave a televised speech about the Hamas efforts as well as a reminder of the purposes of the war. We look back 100 days to remember the educated, the complicit, and the incapacitated among the world powers governed by the law of the jungle, reminding them of an aggression that reached its peak against our past, Al-Quds and Al-Aqsa, with the start of its actual temporal and spatial division and the bringing of red cows as an application of a detestable religious myth designed for aggression against the feelings of an entire nation in the heart of Arab identity and the path of its prophet, the night journey, and ascension to heaven. So, Al-Aqsa Mosque is considered to be the third holiest site in Islam. Third, not first. Due to a mythical, they're calling the Red Heifer story mythical, but it's in the Bible. Due to a mythical night journey from Mecca, as mentioned in Abu Ubaidah's speech, that miraculously brought Muhammad to that very location via a winged donkey-like creature, sounds Nephilim demonic to me, and the teaching continues that Muhammad then ascended into heaven where he received instruction on Islamic prayer before returning to his home by morning. <laughs> uh, he was either on drugs or the devil really took him on some winged freaky beast and then up from there. But what sort of a faith works like that? That you need to travel from Mecca on some winged demonic creature all the way to Jerusalem. And from there on Temple Mount ascend to heaven. Because you couldn't ascend straight from Mecca. So if you can't go to Mecca for, to heaven, is there a problem with Mecca? Which is your holiest sign? Asking for a friend. As of now, four of the heifers remain blemish-free, and according to Temple Institute rabbis, they hope to carry out the ceremony before Passover 2024. That statement from Temple Institute is for that Christian leader who says, no, it's rubbish. And everybody who's uncertain and maybe giving up on their excitement on everything that's lining up for the end times. Enough of that. And again, I decided I'm not going to draw into that too far. So let's look at the problem surrounding the whole disagreement between certain leaders who say one thing about the heifers and others that say another thing and Jews say another thing. And there's all these different opinions going on. And why is there confusion? When it comes to the Jews, besides finding it really difficult to get them to agree on anything, and this is even a Jewish thing, go ask the Jews. They have the oral law. It includes the proper reading of the text, its pronunciation, its punctuation, its vowels, its cantillation, along with the meaning of the words, right? Happy with that so far. The compilation of laws and rulings, known as the Mishnah, along with other accepted compilations, such as the Sifre, the Sifra, the Mechita, the Breta, and the Tosefta, these are all extra biblical writings that they have from amongst their leadership. Now, let me remind you, the Pharisees and Sadducees were their leadership in the time of Yeshua. And they were out to get him and shoot him down around every corner. And if you read what they said about him, not really great people. Those kind of people wrote all these extra biblical things. 
The discussion and debate of that material, known as Talmud or Gemara, the esoteric works, often known as Kabbalah, dangerous, and ethical guides based on Torah and composed by Torah scholars, so people's opinions. The stories and their lessons that are collected in the Talmud and Midrashic works, any other teaching that has been accepted by a long-term consensus of the practicing Jewish community because it is based firm, firmly on some precedent or because it has been demonstrated to emerge and accepted from previous texts and opinions. That's the oral Torah, not the proper Torah. The Torah is constantly being created by its students. How dangerous is that? Can you imagine I said to you the Bible is constantly being created by its students? Then it wouldn't be the inspired word of God, now would it? How could this be if the Torah is supposed to be divine instruction? A simple answer is that the Torah provides general principles and it's up to us to figure out how these principles apply in new situations as they arise. Confusing, right? And this is where a lot of the specific rules and details come in that are not in the Word of God. And I'm of the opinion we take what the Word of God says, God, and we run with that. Not our opinions on that. Our opinions don't matter. God's Word matters. Now they say, the animal which meets these requirements and others could be used to fulfill the commandment of providing the ashes for the purification process. The heifer must be brought to the Mount of Anointment, a precise location on the Mount of Olives, opposite the eastern gate of the Temple Mount. There the heifer must be slaughtered and burned. Afterwards, its ashes are mixed together with natural spring water. It is this solution, called by Torah, the waters of sanctification, which is used to sprinkle on those who are impure. Okay, so that's their process that they're getting ready to do. The Jewish people, depending on the oral tradition for the interpretation of the Torah, the Bible, they say, simply cannot be understood without it. You can't understand the Bible without their oral, extra-biblical writings and traditions and explanations by the great leaders. I have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus that showed us and taught us. We don't need all that stuff from them. We only need the Word of God. Rabbi Meyer only knew that each aspect of the heifer corresponds to an illusion of the golden calf. Because that's what they discussed and decided was the situation. Therefore, he maintained that she should be three or four years of age because only then could it give birth for the mother must give birth to the child and clean up after it. Extra biblical thinking and thought and discussions. But Rabbi Eliezer believed that a heifer could be two years of age because he had no need to find a parallel or comparison with the golden calf. Now there's two great leaders and they have two great opinions and both opinions differ from each other. So the heifer needs to be two years old or the heifer needs to be three to four years old. It was two years old last year. So according to the one rabbi, it was ready to go last year. And now it's three years old this year. So according to the other rabbi, it's ready to go this year. Do you see what happens when you drift from the wisdom and the inspiration and divine authority of the word of God into man? The leadership of man then things become murky. So let me give you examples. A para aduma, or red heifer, is an unblemished and completely red cow that has never been put to work. The animal's ashes used to purify someone who has come into contact with a corpse, for example. So now they've got the Mishnah, the Sifre, all these things. I'm going to touch on a few things. In the Mishnah, if they did not find the residue of the ashes of the seven red cows, they performed the sprinkling with those of six, of five, of four, of three, of two, of one. And who prepared these? Moses prepared the first, Ezra prepared the second, and five were prepared 
from the time of Ezra, the words of Rabbi Meir. But the sages say, seven from the time of Ezra, and who prepared them? Shimon the just, and Yohanan the high priest prepared two each. Eluiahenu, the son of Hakof, and Hanamel the Egyptian, and Ishmael the son of Piyabi prepared one each. And then they're saying now, number 10 will be prepared by Messiah, or Antichrist in this case. Sifrei Bamitbar 123 verse 2. And you shall give it, the red heifer, to Eleazar the Kohen. Scripture comes to teach us about the red heifer, that it is processed by the adjutant high priest. Know this to be so, for Aaron was alive and Eleazar burned the heifer. And you shall give it. This one was processed by Eleazar and others were processed by the high priest. These are the words of R. Meyer, R. Yossi, R. Yehuda, R. Shimon, and R. Eleazar. And Yaakov says, this one was processed by Eleazar and others. So the rabbis, different opinions and thoughts on the history and who did what in the situation. Yoma 41b, 14-42a-11. The Gemara discusses halachot pertaining to the strip of crimson wool. Rabbi Yitzhak said, I heard a teaching that there is a distinction between two strips of crimson, one of the red heifer and one of the scapegoat. One of them requires a minimum amount and one does not require a minimum amount. But I do not know to which of them the requirement to have a minimum amount pertains. We will have to examine the matter. Extra biblical and hence confusion. Do you see? The Mishneh Torah. All of the activities performed with the red heifer from the beginning to the end must be performed only during the day and by male priests and the performance of work disqualifies it until it is reduced to ashes. Once reduced to ashes, it is acceptable even if its ashes were collected at night by a woman or one performed another task while collecting them. What is the source that teaches the collection of the ashes is acceptable if performed by any person with the exception of a deaf mute, an intellectually or emotionally incapable person or a minor? Because Numbers 19 verse 9 says, And a pure man shall gather the ashes of the heifer. It can be derived that a priest is not required. Moreover, if it is as if it said a pure person, either a man or a woman. But the Bible says a pure man and already. But did it say that? Maybe we should. The Mishnah Torah read here for 13 verse 12. Everyone's word is accepted with regard to the ritual purity of articles and persons involved in the purification process, even common people. The rationale is that because of all the stringencies and extra measures applied, everyone is careful to regard it. This is alluded to in the Torah, which states in Numbers 19.9, it will be for the congregation of Israel for safekeeping. It implies that all of Israel is fit for its safekeeping. Therefore, if a common person brings an earthenware container from his home, and says this container is pure. For the heifer it will be considered as pure. No examples in the Bible of where people have lied in Israel? Anyway. They also said in the Midrash. Tanchuma 4, 6 and 8. Rabbi Yossi Berebi Hanina says. The Holy One. Blessed be He. Said to Moshe. To you I will reveal the reason for the red heifer. But not to others. Only Moses can know the reason for the red heifer. Big secret between God and Moses. Sound right to you? Sifrei Bamitbar 124.1 And he shall burn the heifer before his eyes. Scripture apprises us about the heifer that preoccupation with any other work invalidates the burning. Even without this being stated, 
If it invalidates its slaughtering, should it not invalidate its burning? What need is there for a verse? Scripture apprises us that work invalidates it from the time of slaughtering until it becomes ashes. We don't need a verse. We don't need the Bible. We can just figure this one out on ourselves. The Yoma 2a verse 3 to 10, Gemara. The Halakha of sequestering the high priest prior to the performance of the temple service on Yom Kippur is comparable to the sequestering of the priest designated to burn the red heifer. Therefore, the Gemara cites that which we learned in a Mishnah. Seven days prior to the burning of the red heifer, the sages would remove the priest who burns the heifer from his house to the chamber that was before the Bira to the northeast corner of the courtyard of Temple Mount. So now the priest needs to be sequestered for seven days in a very specific spot before he performs the duty. Mishnah Torah, red heifer, none of its ashes are brought into the temple courtyard for storage. It says, and he shall place it outside the camp. The ashes were divided into three portions, one placed in the chayl, one on the Mount of Olives, and one divided amongst priestly guard posts. The one divided amongst all the priestly watches was used by the priests to sanctify themselves. The one placed on the Mount of Olives used by the entire Jewish people for sprinkling. So that's all extra biblical, extra works, oral traditions and laws that the Jews have regarding the red heifer. And so you see the differences I'm pointing out there between things like it must be two years old, it must be three years old. But wait, there's more. The cow must be at a minimum within its third year of life, two years plus a bit. Okay, so trying to find a middle ground between those two leaders two years and three to four years. It needs to be completely red, even two hairs of a different color next to each other or three that are apart disqualify the animal. All physical blemishes that disqualify sacrificial animals disqualify the red heifer as well. Any work done with it disqualifies the cow. Work in this case and here we go back into the extra biblical thought, includes a person leaning on it. If a person leans on the red heifer, they can chuck it away. Placing a garment or a cloth upon it, disqualified. Unless it was done to safeguard the animal. So if you put a cloth on it, you've disqualified it. But if you tell them you did it because you were safeguarding the animal, it's not disqualified. Placing a yoke on the cow, even if it doesn't actually do the work, disqualifies it. If the heifer is pregnant or a male has mated with it, disqualified. Okay. Let's go back to the truth. What is the root of what God was saying with regards to the red heifer? Numbers chapter 19. Okay. Now the Lord Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. That's it. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Okay, so did you hear how old it needs to be and all those things that are included in the extra biblical information there? Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, its offal shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, he shall bathe in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean until evening. And the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, 
bathe in water and shall be unclean until evening. Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who dwells among them. Okay. So it's very simple. Judaism has just added many standards and extra criteria to what you just heard, which is what God actually said regarding this. Talmudic tradition speaks of the type of rope that a red heifer was to be bound with, the direction it was to face when being slaughtered, the words spoken by the priest, the wearing of sandals during the ritual. The rabbinical rules listed many things that would disqualify a red heifer from being sacrificed if she had been ridden or re leaned on, if she had a garment placed on her, if a bird rested on her. If she had two black or white hairs, among other conditions, not found in biblical text. These are extra biblical rules and laws from rabbinical tradition by the Jews. They've added and added and added more works and works and works to this whole process, making it more difficult and more difficult, more difficult for themselves. When God was pretty straightforward with what he said. Interesting. And sad. So, are these heifers ready to go? According to the way I read my Bible, not extra biblical Jewish rabbinical writings and oral traditions. The way I read my Bible, yep, anytime, anytime, good to go. No problem. Ready. And it is a process they will go through in the building of their third temple with the blinds. On their eyes and their hard hearts as they try to find their way back to God in the next seven years. All part of the signs of the end times. So do not let people rain on your parade and tell you it's not going to happen or it's not important. Even their temple institute says they want to get it done before Passover 2024. Even they know it's ready and good to go. It is exciting because everything is lining up just like the book of Revelation said that it would. Jesus is literally drawing up the ranks of heaven in preparation to come and pick you up. And everything I see that excites me with regards to that, I will be talking about on this channel, regardless of what some leader says of me in the process. I stand and encourage the body for God. That is my mission. That is part of my ministry. To make sure that you're encouraged, to make sure you're excited, to make sure you're watching, you're looking up, you're learning, you're drawing closer to God, you're drilling deeper into the word of God, that no man deceives you. So, be excited. The heifers might not be excited, but I surely am. Shalom.